Let's talk about the doctrine of sin from a Christian theological perspective. I believe it was G.K. Chesterton who, it is said, once commented that the doctrine of original sin is the only major Christian doctrine which is empirically verifiable. Now, that was somewhat, of course, tongue-in-cheek, but nonetheless, there is certainly a, a resonance about the doctrine of sin, about the brokenness of humanity. And I want to take a, a moment here to uh, do a little bit of a theological exploration of the concept of sin. So to begin with, we want to divide between two basic approaches to the doctrine of sin. To begin with, there is what is called the nomological approach to sin. This comes from the Greek nomos, or law. Here, the idea is that sin is best understood in terms of the violation of law, the failure to follow moral obligation, uh, obligations as to what we ought to do and as to what we ought to refrain from doing. A second approach to the doctrine of sin focuses not on law, but rather on ends or purposes. This is the teleological approach. So telos, end or purpose for which one was created. So here the idea is that sin arises when one fails to achieve the end or purpose for which one was created. Now the nomological and teleological approaches to sin need not be incompatible with one another. One could develop an overall understanding of sin which encompasses both the violation of law and the failure to achieve one's end. For example, it could be that one's end includes following moral obligations and thus refraining from uh, moral negations, things that we ought not to do. And so you could certainly reconcile these two views. But what I wanna look at here is uh, to reflect on a particular definition of sin uh, which is a nomological one, and just use it as a particular heuristic. In other words, as a mode of investigation uh, to seek new discovery and understanding of the concept of sin from the perspective of law keeping or the nomological approach. With that in mind, we're going to take a look at one definition of sin. And this one comes from Baptist theologian Millard Erickson's uh, textbook, Christian Theology where he defines sin as following. Sin is any lack of conformity, active or passive, to the moral law of God. This may be a matter of act, of thought, or of inner disposition or state. Now, for the next few minutes, I just want to unpack this definition that Erickson gives us, because I think it is helpfully summarized here, a nomological approach to sin. The first thing I want to focus on is this language, active or passive. Here I call to mind uh, uh, the Book of Common Prayer, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, and this famous confession therein. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there's no health in us. So. In this confession, you find two things in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. The, we have left undone those things which we ought to have done. In other words, we failed to do what we ought to have done. And those things which we ought not to have done, we have done. So in other words, we've done things that we shouldn't have. This is active and passive. So the idea of the passive conformity to the law of, or the passive lack of conformity to the law of God involves failure to do what you ought to do. Active lack of conformity involves doing what you should not do. And these are both problems. Often we focus simply on the active. You shouldn't do that. But it is equally a problem uh, to fail passively to follow the law, the law of God. You should do that. There are moments where we are morally obliged not to act and do something. There are other moments where we are morally obliged to do something. I recently watched a video of a Walmart greeter uh, at a Walmart in British Columbia. And a man comes into the store and he tells this man, I'm sorry, but you have to wear a mask because we're in the middle of a pandemic for COVID-19. You know, the store policy is all customers have to wear masks. 
Now, now this uh, person who was given the message, he was, of course, just the messenger of the store policy, which itself is designed to protect the population from the spread of a pandemic. In addition, this Walmart greeter who was issuing the message was handicapped. You know what happens? This guy grabs him, throws him to the ground, climbs on top of him and starts punching him repeatedly in the face. And all of this is captured on store security cameras. That man who assaulted this, this individual simply for presenting a store policy which is intended to protect the entire population, his attack of this man was an act of violation, an act of lack of conformity to the moral law of God. He physically assaulted this man for no good reason. But in addition, there were multiple people who stood around there looking and doing nothing. They were just sort of frozen in inaction. Now, I'm not saying that an 80-year-old grandmother uh, should, should try to take on this young punk who's beating this guy. But you have here a whole store of people that were looking and doing nothing. They weren't shouting, right? They weren't physically trying to pull this man off. They weren't pleading with him to stop. In that moment, those people are culpable for a passive lack of conformity to the moral law of God. And each one of those is a moral indictment of the character of the individual. So that's active or passive. We're going to continue on then to the next, uh, folk, uh, next point of, of the definition. So Erickson then says, this may be a matter of act. So it's, in other words, something you do. So it's, you know, you physically assault somebody or you fail to stop that person from physically assaulting that person. That's also a matter of act. It's an action. An action, a state of affairs in which you are failing to do the right thing by doing the wrong thing. In other words, not acting. As the old saying goes, uh, for evil to succeed, all that is required is for good people to do nothing, right? That is a failure of action, which itself is an action. And, and so this is the first dimension, really, of the moral law. It pertains to actions and omissions. We can put it like that. But then Erickson's definition continues. It is also a matter of thought. <clears throat> Some years ago, I was listening to Dr. Laura Schlesinger. I don't know if you know or remember her. She was uh, really big on talk radio in the 90s and early 2000s. She was, at the time that I started listening to her in the late 90s, she had returned to her Jewish roots. I mean, for years she had been secular, a psychologist, but then she returned to her Jewish roots and she began to integrate her Jewish theology and ethic into the advice that she would give to callers who would just call in and ask about all manner of different issues. And she was very interesting to listen to because she was very plain spoken and would tell people exactly what she thought they should be doing and you know, snap out of it. Why are you doing this? You should be doing that. And it made for interesting talk radio. She would also, of course, bring her Jewish ethical perspective in. So one time this guy calls in and he says, Dr. Laura, I'm having like these sort of sexual fantasies about my neighbor's spouse. And this was Dr. Laura's reply. She says, I don't really care what you think about. I care what you do. So don't act upon your fantasies. Now, that advice that Dr. Laura gave that man is an advice that many people have thought is actually very intuitive, that your private thought life is your own. It only becomes an issue of sin or of moral responsibility and culpability when you begin to act on your thoughts. But of course, this actually runs counter to the teaching of Jesus uh, when he says in the Sermon on the Mount that if you've even thought about doing something, then you are morally responsible for the action itself in terms of your internal thought processes, your intentions, your desires. You're responsible for it already at that point. If you've thought about committing adultery, if you've thought about murder, if you've thought about some other evil or sinful or wicked action, already you are morally indicted because of your inner thought life. So it's not that morality and ethics is simply an external action in the public sphere, the public square. It is also something that is going on in your inner thought life. This, of course, uh, is a, a much more rigorous ethical understanding of, of, of 
the right life than that which was presented by Dr. Laura. And frankly, I mean, I think it's also intuitively correct uh, because of course, as out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you have a corrupt inner life, that will inevitably impact your public life as well. Uh, but one other point I, I just want to make here, there's, to my mind, a really powerful illustration of this Christian perspective from the writer Harry Blamires in his book, The Christian Mind, where he says, from the Christian perspective, from a Christian mind perspective, uh, a judge sitting in a courtroom who for 40 years has sentenced criminals to jail may himself be the most corrupt moral person ever in that courtroom because of his inner thought life. And that is the disturbing moral indictment of the Christian perspective on sin that comes with this declaration. It can also encompass your thoughts as well as your actions. This brings us to the, the penultimate point of stop on our survey, and that is the question of inner disposition. Now, this is, in a sense, even more disturbing than thought. In the perspective of thought, you've already had the, the you've reflected on some action. You haven't acted on it yet, but it's part of your inner thought life. You've thought about adultery. You've thought about murder. You've thought about stealing. You've thought about cheating. Inner disposition takes it to the next step and says this, even if you never actually think about it, the additional question we must consider is this, counterfactually, if you had the opportunity to think about it, would you at that point think about it? And would you potentially in that counterfactual situation act upon it? Here the disturbing issue is this, that it may be simply by happenstance that one never thinks the wrong thing or does the wrong thing. Uh, think for example about a man who, or a, a young boy who grows up uh, in an isolated community and he was, he's only ever known 15 people in this community. And one of those people is the young lady that he eventually marries and he remains faithfully committed to her for the next 40 years of marriage. And they have a happy marriage, but counterfactually, had he left this tiny commune of 15 people and gone out into the world, he would have seen many other women and had multiple affairs and cheated on his wife. It turns out that because uh, there was only one young woman and 14 men within this community, this commune, that he never even has the opportunity to think about other women, let alone cheating with them. In that case, the fact that he led a happy marriage with this woman does not necessarily morally exonerate him in terms of his inner moral character as a creature of sin. Because counterfactually, had he left the commune and had the opportunity to interact with other people and meet other women, he would have cheated on his spouse multiple times and violated his marital vows. That brings us from act and from thought to the inner core, the inner disposition of the individual. And here, the recognition of sin from Erickson's broader perspective is that this is a lack of conformity, even in terms of our inner dispositions of which we may not even be aware. Even those inner dispositions, counterfactually, had we been in another situation, we might have done that. Here's where we get that famous quip, there but for the grace of God go I. The man who in a particular moment commits a murder, and it is a shocking event, but when you reflect on it and think, had I been in that circumstance, might I have done that murder as well? Had I been driving home late one night, and this, this person at a pedestrian crosswalk had crossed <clears throat> and I hadn't seen them and I actually hit them and they were, I saw them dead on the street. Would I have taken off and driven home and tried to cover up the hit and run or would I have gone to the police? And if you're not 100% sure about how you would act, that is an indictment on your character now because of your counterfactual inner disposition to act a different way given different circumstances. This brings us finally to the last stop on our survey of the nomological dimensions of sin, and that is our inner state. This brings us back to what Christians often refer to as the fallen human nature or the sin nature. Now, nature, technically in philosophy, often refers to what we call a kind essence 
In other words, it it's, refers to the essential conditions that are required for you to be the kind of thing you are. And we don't mean that we have a sin nature in that sense, because sin is not essential to what human beings are. In fact, sin, from the Christian perspective, is a parasitic distortion of what human beings are or what we are called to be. We are called to be actually like Christ, conform to the image of God, not to be these broken creatures who regularly violate the moral requirements of God actively and passively in terms of our actions, thoughts, and inner dispositions. So we don't have a moral uh, fallen nature, sin nature in that sense. But you can say that we have a sin nature in the sense that the distortions that exist within us as a species and as individuals are such that they will be nat naturally actualized in time and thereby resulting in violations of the moral law in terms of actions and failures to act in terms of inner thoughts that are distorted and counterfactual dispositions that would lead us astray if they had the opportunity to be actualized. And in that sense, even uh, when we get down to our most basic inner state, that too is corrupted. I'll conclude with a quick illustration. So you have a fox and it gives birth to a bunch of baby foxes, kits, I believe they're called. <clears throat> and so these kits, they look like they wouldn't hurt a fly, right? And they are innocent little babies, they're so cute. But you know that when those small foxes, those kids, get to a particular age, their instinctual impulses will take over. So that if they got loose in a hen house, they would kill as many chickens as they would have the opportunity to kill. And the disturbing question, the disturbing issue about the Christian understanding of the doctrine of sin is that with our inner state or nature, it is distorted to the extent that even though we are born without having committed sins, we have the natural distortions and impulses that will lead us inevitably to the point where we will engage in active and passive failures of conformity to the moral law of God in terms of actions, thoughts, and inner dispositions. And that is uh, a quick and I think rather disturbing survey of the doctrine of sin from a nomological perspective. So here's the kind of image we are left with that as you reflect, I think more and more on this, and the extent to which sin impacts the multiple levels of our character and actions, <clears throat> then you realize that as we journey through the process of sober introspection into our own character, we will have a deepened sense for the extent to which we are indeed broken, sinful beings. And I believe the extent to which uh, we do in fact need the grace of a savior. <laughs>